This is Duke University. Cool. Thanks a lot. This is a, uh, it's a very cool room, actually. It's the first time I've been here. Um, so I'm Jesse Lipson. And I'm Brooks. And really tonight, we, what we wanted to do, it's Global Entrepreneur Week, and uh, we wanted to spend a few minutes and tell you our story. Uh, we were Duke students as well, just like some of you guys, and hope and most of you guys are Duke entrepreneurs. Um, and so kind of our, our story of entrepreneurial journey and lessons learned, and then we want to open it up for any questions that you guys might have. So some quick facts. Jess and I are married, and we both have our own companies. And we're going to share our story end to end about this uh, tonight. So it so for all. Those, for those of you guys who are wondering why you know, I look like I'm in disguise compared to the picture there, <laughs> I, uh, it's Movember, for those of you who don't know. So uh, we're growing mustaches for uh, men's cancer awareness. And, and uh, that plus the glasses makes me look like I'm in disguise. So. <laughs> So, um, so to start at the beginning, so Jess and I, we both went to Duke. Uh, I graduated in 2002, and he graduated in 2011. And we met when, 2000. yes, 2000. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, way, I'm way older Rob, than I look. Robbie, Robbie right. in the cradle. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we met, we met in 1999 when I was a freshman, and he was a junior. I, there's a whole other story related to that, but we won't go over that tonight. Um, so we met in January, and um, Jess was, he told me when I met him, he was going to be a philosophy uh, professor. And I had no idea you know, what my future was going to be since I had just started at Duke. Uh, but we decided to, you know, we, got, we got very serious very quickly and decided to live together that summer, freshman after my, uh, summer after my freshman year. Uh, and so, we were trying to figure, Jess was going to take some classes, and you know, I was just trying to stay in the area versus going back home uh, to Alaska, where I'm from. And I was looking for what I was going to do, and I saw these flyers all over campus uh, advertising tuition painters, and, which is a college painting crew. So what I really liked about these flyers is the headline was, don't get a summer job, run a summer business. So I had some seeds of interest in entrepreneurship. Both my parents were entrepreneurs uh, or small business owners. And so I kind of liked the idea of getting some experience running my own business. So I signed up and just you know, stayed here to do his um, classes. And it ended up being the worst summer ever. <laughs> that is actually very similar to a house that I actually had to repaint. Uh, the idea is that you hire a lot of uh, other college students and they work for you. As it happens, that doesn't work with Duke. Duke students don't work for other Duke students. Uh, and we, um, we had all kinds of problems. We our, st our ladders got stolen halfway through the summer. Uh, we ran through all kinds, you know, we had a hard time finding painters. We're, and, uh, and Jess and I ended up working together, painting houses um, together in 100 degree weather that summer. Um, this was the, the car that we drove, uh, it's a 70s era Chinook that um, is, we ma marketed as the paint mobile. And we uh, end up, I mean, the summer, first of all, tuition painters, one of the things that we learned about tu tuition painters as a franchise, so it's not really entrepreneurship. They just find unsuspecting 18 year old <laughs> college students. And then the, what they, the way it was, uh, the deal was structured is that I would give 25% of my gross revenue to the franchise. So say you sell a job for $1,000, that means immediately $250 goes to the main office, and then you buy your paint, then you, hire, hire, you pay your painters, and if there's anything left over, then eventually I would get it. And of course, there was never anything left over. So I finished the um, summer with $2,000 in debt, and the only profit I made all summer was selling the Paintmobile uh, at a profit by bundling it with my ladders, which I didn't need by the end of time the summer was over. So that was our en entry into the entrepreneurial scene. So what we learned in 1999 was that revenue is totally different from profit, you know, some fundamentals in, uh, in finance, that 25, paying 25% 25 of gross revenue, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And lastly, we learned that ex inmates are excellent painters. 
We, we actually picked up a painter on work release from the Durham County Jail every day, and we paid him in cigarettes. And he was a fantastic <laughs> painter, totally committed, and uh, the best you know, we had all summer. So, th so then we moved into this house, and Jess can talk about the next iteration of our entrepreneurial journey. So <clears throat> fall of 99, this was kind of the, the height of the dot-com dot com bubble, I guess, I guess you could say. I was a senior in college. Um, we had uh, five seniors and, and Brooks living in this house. And Brooks and I, it was only a four bedroom house, so Brooks and I were literally living in the, in the garage. So totally entrepreneur, entrepreneurial cliche, but we're living in a garage, an unheated garage, you know, sharing it with some cockroaches and, and other bugs in, in the garage that summer. And um, <clears throat> during that time, I was, I, w I was a philosophy major at the time, and so I wasn't really planning on going into entrepreneurship, but I had friends that were coming up with startup ideas, and some of them were even raising angel funding, some of them were raising venture funding, and, and um, it, was, it was a crazy time for, the, for those of you guys who remember back in, in the dot-com boom. There were companies that were literally going from idea to IPO in, in 12 months. And so at that point, I um, kind of, I, I would say I, I reawakened my entrepreneurial spirit. So. When I was a little kid, I was very entrepreneurial, and then I went through a long period where I thought I wanted to go into academics, and then I think it was the dot-com boom that really made me realize that I loved entrepreneurship. And so, um, okay, and it was uh, it, pets.com is kind of like the emblem of the the dot-com excess that happened at the time, and so. I, I graduated college and I went to work for an internet startup as my first job. So we, I had an idea my senior year, and it was this site called Easy Central. And this is actually a, a screenshot of the concept of Easy Central. I won't get too much into what it, what it was supposed to do, but it was uh, a mock-up that Brooks actually drew. And one thing that I think is funny is like the, if you look up in the, uh, yeah, the upper right-hand corner, the browser is Netscape Navigator, which was the, by far the dominant browser at the time. And the uh, screenshot was optimized for a 640 by 480 pixel resolution. And so, I mean, by comparison, your iPhone right now has probably around, a, it's around a 1200 by 600 resolution. And so it's crazy how times have changed. In the um, Norwood house that we lived in, we, we were all, once we got off campus, we were all on dial-up connections. So we had five phone lines that ran into the house. That we personally installed. We personally we installed. We got up there and wired them. <laughs> and the people, like the Dur Durham um, uh, police or their, their, their uh, government kind of people were looking, looking out at us, worrying. They were investigating us. So they thought we were doing something sketchy, having so many lines, like some kind of drug house or something. <laughs> Getting so many lines. So I mean, it's it's really amazing how that was that was 99, 2000. How far technology's come in that in, the, in that period of time. But uh, so I, I I ended up graduating college and, and I went to work for uh, an internet startup called called Full Seven at the time. I think we so we, sk we, we skipped, skipped a couple. It's all right. Um, you go ahead and. Okay, so we skipped a couple slides, but so we so we shut that down. Uh, after the dot com, but but you know, boom and bust happened. Jess went off and um, got a job at a local startup, and I went off and inter interned with three startups in the area: uh, Auction Rover, Red Hat, and Windwire. And so we, you know, took a little. Both of us went and got a little bit of, you know, took a little bit of a break, but we still had the urge to start a company. And, but having the experience with Easy Central, which never went anywhere, uh, we decided that what we, a better um, next step was if we want to be serious about being entrepreneurs, then we need, we need to be realistic about what we can actually accomplish. And so we thought we need to have an idea that we, is a proven business model, doesn't require capital, that we can do immediately, and we can do it out of our second bedroom. And so, that led to us founding Novel Projects, which is a website company, just a basic website company, that came about with, because Jess helped get a website built for his company, and I was taking a graphic design class at Duke that required you know, some kind of design, which seemed like a website would be a good thing to do. So we just wanted to get, some, get something going that we could make $5,000 every six months, which would be plenty to cover our you know, poverty-level lifestyle <laughs> at the time. 
and so we um, we were um, so Novel Projects was doing well. Um, we were. First, well, the first website was for my mom, then a second website for his mom, and then it was for my mom's friend. Um, and then we met um, Ben Feldman, who is also a Duke alum, who's also a local entrepreneur. And we landed doing the website for MD Everywhere. And then we land did the website for Duke Divinity School, um, which was a 300-page website, which actually stayed live up until, like, what, 2009? So, which I don't think is the best practice to keep your website for that long, but... Um, it's kind of proud that it lasted. And that led to us landing um, AOL. So we were um, doing really well over those years. Um, and so kind of as around that time, we brought back two of the guys who lived in the house with, with us um, to be our partners, uh, Dan and Rob. So that's, here's the picture of them. Um, so at, because Jess and I, we were liberal arts majors. We didn't have like, like our HTML skills. The way we built these websites, our secret, is that we would go around, find a website that we really liked, and we'd view the source, download it, and just replace all the images and rewrite the copy. That was our more or less how we built these websites. And um, so we needed to go get a little bit better than that. So we brought back these guys who were com computer science majors. And we decided that since we'd only been doing this for a year, that we should split our revenue four ways, split our equity four ways, 25% each, um, and that while we're at it, we might as well have unanimous decision making. You know, because that's a fair thing. We all need to agree to do, get anything done. So you can, um, so the, and the other thing that was working is that, um, here's a picture of the website, or the, a snippet from it. Um, actually, you can speak to this, Jess, kind of the other reason, you know, the way we're winning all these big websites. Yes, yeah, so this is a screenshot from uh, the NovelProjects.com website, and, you know, we highlight the first line here, Novel Projects is not about web, web design, it's about service, and um, that's the way we differentiated ourselves early on, because, you know, I was a self-taught programmer, philosophy major. Um, our, we were competing against other website companies that had several years of experience, and programmers who are computer science majors. And so the way that we were able to differentiate ourselves was really by outworking our competition, underpricing our competition. And one of the things that was interesting is that we found is that most clients can't tell the difference between a website that was programmed by somebody with one year of experience or you know, 10 years of experience. What they do notice is whether you return their phone calls on time, whether you know, if you take notes at the meeting and send them meeting notes and um, and, and those are the kind of things that even somebody who's non-technical can, can pick up as a cue for the quality of service. And so um, we never did any sales. Like Brooke said, we, we first did a website for free for her mom. And you know, we didn't tell other people that we did it for free, but we put that in our portfolio and, and showed that as an example of our work. And the next time we did one for my mom's company, and then referrals started happening. And so uh, those customers that she showed before um, MD Everywhere, uh, Duke Divinity School, and, and, uh, and all the other customers that came, pretty much just came through referrals. So we made somebody really, really happy. They referred us, or they went to a new job, and they called us, and um, the business started to grow. Our total goal was to have a raving client that was above profit, above everything else. We would do anything at all costs to have a raving client. And I think that that was kind of a, we didn't realize at a time, but it was really a core value. It was part of our DNA from the very beginning is that client service is, is, is everything. Um, and, and I think that has been a theme, as you'll see, as we move forward. So the problem, back to Dan and Rob uh, and our partner stru stru structure, after we, landed AOL. They were a very profitable client. Um, and they ended up being 70 or 80% of our revenue. And they're kind of in online marketing, not exactly the same as website design. And I was mostly working with them. And these guys were getting better and better in their HTML and their development skills. Um, and all of a sudden, we had cash in the bank. And so the problem was that we couldn't decide whether or not how to use it. I thought, well, we have AOL. We should get more designers. And we should take the strategy towards following the online marketing opportunity. We should, we should become an online marketing company. And 
the rest of the guys thought, since they're more development oriented, they thought that, well, we should build a product company, since that's a better long-term business model. Even though it's more, um, more risky, it's a better long-term vision. And because we had made everything unanimous, we could not agree. We were completely locked up in this decision because there was money at stake. There was a company at stake. And we just could not negotiate our way out of that. So eventually we hired uh, a mediator who eventually advised that <laughs> novel projects really could not work going forward. And so that led to its ultimate demise, and we split it into two companies, which is my company, Brooksville Interactive, uh, and Sharefile. So it was the beginning of basically you know, our current iteration. So now I want, so what we learned is that friends and partnerships often don't mix. I mean, we lived with these guys. Um, we were great friends with them. Uh, and so, I mean, we'd worked with them, with Easy Central. But once there's something at stake, it's, it's a, a relationship is totally different than when you're just friends. And second of all, visit, vision alignment is crucial. I think the core problem, we, maybe we could have worked together as friends had we had those tough conversations about really what's the vision of this company. If we are successful, are we going to be, world, be building the world's best website company? Are we going to be building a platform or a product? Are we, you know, where are we going? Uh, should we be successful? And we never had that conversation. And lastly, I would just avoid unanimous anything. There always needs to be some kind of structure. Someone has to be in charge. Someone needs to be CEO. There has, and there should never be unanimous. It'll just destroy the company. So at this point, um, since we have now two stories, they're pretty much diverged at this point, I'm going to spend a couple minutes sharing my story. And then we'll circle back around. And then Jess will share a couple minutes with his story. That's OK with you guys. You want to push it forward for me? OK. So, um, so I want to talk about AOL for a second. AOL was doing A-B testing, um, which is what I do now. This was 10 years ago. And they were selling dial-up. And they, they were very performance oriented. They would hire a whole bunch of tiny agencies just like me and show them a, a con what's called a control, uh, a, a creative. And they would say, give, me, give us a bunch of alternative designs. And we will test it against this. And if one of your designs wins, then we'll hire you again. And if it doesn't, you know, this might be your last project. And so that's, uh, A-B testing is always testing stuff against each other. Um, AOL had this really advanced uh, marketing analytics and their own embedded IT, and they were super sophisticated, much more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated than a lot of companies are now when it comes to testing. So my first project, I designed these six pop-ups. They're all equally horrible, <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Um, the longer you look at them, the worse they get. Mm -hmm. uh, a miracle happened, and one of them beat the control despite, despite how it looks and became the control for the next six months. And uh, so that was an amazing thing. And then that led to the next three years. It was of, I did a ton of creative for AOL. Uh, so we, I launched AOL 9.0. I did thousands of pop-ups and emails and landing pages. And I hired a bunch of designers to help me out with that. I picked up another couple of clients like Weight Watchers and Nickelodeon and Monster. But for the most part, AOL was you know, my big client. We were an AOL company. And I would just wait for them to call. And I would do what they asked. And, you know, and we made a lot of money that, those three years. And I had 60% profit margins. I mean, if you look at my financials, they were amazing. Um, but I had absolutely no strategy, no good operations. It was simply an AOL shop. And what I learned during those years is that testing is amazing. And it's the obvious thing that the internet is made for, um, that data-driven, uh, performance-oriented uh, approach where you can measure everything is, just seemed like the, the obvious future. And I also learned you know, that I was totally organic. I would hire designers as I, as I needed them. And I was looking at my financials, and they were all looking great. So this seemed like just a really good way to build a business. Uh, unfortunately, um, this is looking back. Uh, you can click forward, Jess. That's when I started working with AOL. And so my future was tied to their future. Uh, and it didn't look, had I seen that now, I mean, look, I mean, it didn't see, I would, wouldn't really advise anyone to plan um, on a 
going that direction. Um, and so in 2006, <laughs> 2006 was my best year, and I remember uh, three quarters, we had amazing quarters, and then August 2006, I got a call and they said, we're about to lay off 4,000 people, and you shouldn't expect any more revenue from us this year or next year. And they were 80% of my business, and in 2007, they dropped to 15% of my business. So 2007 was the beginning of, as you can see, some rough well, seas ahead. Um, because then now we know 2008, we had a lovely recession that was coming in. And uh, so it was, I want to start to tell you about my dark years. So the good news in all of this is that I had worked at this, by 2006, we were one of AOL's top three agencies, and we had worked with about 50 different people within AOL. And so we had a great network. And all of those people got laid off, but they all went to new places. And so over those next three years, oh, Jess, back those up, back that up. Um, over, the, over the next three years, I got 35 new clients. And I'm sorry. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> all right. So, um, so the six of the client of my clients were in display, and so I was thinking, if I have six display clients, maybe I should go down the media path. Um, but then I also had nine clients who were hiring us for landing pages. So I thought maybe our future should be in search marketing. And then I had I had 19 email clients. And so the obvious direction should be retention marketing. And you know, that seemed like the, you know, probably the most promising. Unfortunately, my biggest client was Nickelodeon, and we were doing game development for them, uh, which is completely different from everything else. And so we had a very difficult time figuring out what we were going to do. And over those next three years, we really tried all three of them at one various point. And so um, another problem is I still love testing. And only 40% of my clients tested at all, and only one in, one in five of those, so a tiny percentage of them, actually even shared the data with us. Uh, we didn't run, we didn't give them any data, we had no data role, we didn't even know how our stuff was doing, which was a huge contrast to the AOL days where we always knew if our stuff worked. And that was really our reputation, is that our stuff worked. But now, in this period of time, we had no idea if it worked, and that was, um, really just troubling because that's what people thought, you know, we stopped knowing even if we could follow through on our reputation. So, the, what, so I was struggling to find the right path. And what I knew was missing, the big piece, if we ever want to be a testing company, we needed to have data. But I didn't know how that analytics worked at all within any, within any large company. I didn't know the role, did marketing, you know, where did they get their data, what platforms do they use, do they ever outsource that kind of thing? You know, I, it was a, compl it was a comp total black box. And so to try to figure that out, I started spending a lot of time out, out of the office. I went to several conferences, analytics conferences, over the next three years. I, mean, I was probably gone 50% of the time hanging out with analysts. Uh, and also trying to find one to work for us, but just trying to grasp what that world was like. So while I was out of the office, my team was, get, was exhausted. Um, they were working really hard with all of these 35 clients, running themselves into the ground, and not only were they working really hard, but it was extreme, it was very, there was a lot of anxiety because we did not know who we are or where we were going. We had no idea what our long-term strategy was, and that over time was very stressful for them and for me. And also having me in the, out of the office constantly was also, it was this void of leadership uh, in the company. And those years, I went through 25 employees, something like um, six designers, seven account managers, five developers. I mean, people, we had major churn, uh, which was also very difficult in order to keep a consistent delivery and keep our client service up. Um, our only priority at that time, had not, it was to please our clients at all costs, because that is what, what had worked in the past, uh, to, and to say yes to every client, because we had just lost our big client, and we were just trying to keep the lights on and pay our payroll. Culture was our last priority. So all that changed in 2010 when I met these two bald men. So quickly, 
the one on the left is Dr. Bell. He is in Chapel Hill. He runs the Bell Leadership Institute. Amazing leadership guru. He is incredible. Um, he helped, when he was in his 20s, he helped select the next Coca-Cola CEO and has interviewed 100,000 leaders and has a great point of view on, about leadership. Uh, fundamentally, he believes that great leaders build great companies, good leaders build good companies, and bad leaders destroy companies. And so if you really want to have a great company, then you have to invest in your own leadership skills, invest in the leadership school, skills of your team, grow your team so that they can build you a great company. And I spent a whole year learning his point of view, so I can't really summarize it in five minutes. But fundamentally, leadership is a crucial skill. And it's also a very difficult skill to acquire. And that I wasn't the best leader. Um, and that's something I needed to start working on if I, needed to, if I wanted to have a great company. He also talked about commitment. Uh, he said that you can't build a great company unless you have 100% commitment um, from the top down. He said, rate yourself on a 1 to 10 on your commitment to your vision. And if it's an under a 9, then you should shut your company down and move on to your next one, That you, if you have any desire to build a great company. And then second of all, you do the same thing for all your employees. And if your employees have less than a 9, then they've got to go. Otherwise, you'll never build a great company. So I did that, um, I did that exercise. I realized that my, um, my commitment you know, was faltering, and most of my employees you know, weren't that impressed with themselves. So the other bald man is um, Seth Godin. And so he is an author and a big blocker. A lot, a lot of you probably have heard of him. And I got to spend three days in his office um, with uh, 15 other women entrepreneurs. It was a program that he was running. And I learned a lot of, uh, from him. It was an amazing experience. But the one thing, the one part I wanted to share with you is that one of the exercises he had us all do is he had us all take out a three by five card and put, uh, write down a wish, uh, any, any wish. Uh, he said, write down something you'd like to have in 90 days, if it could be anything. Uh, and so I wrote down that I, my wish, after thinking about it, was alignment. I realized, kind of hanging out with Seth Godin, that what I wanted was a data-informed testing company. That is the mission, the idea that I would have a 10 on the scale of commitment, that this was, that was my vision. That's what I had fallen in love with, with AOL so many years ago. But what I had built was a design-driven email company which I'm not that, I wasn't that committed to it. And we had basically a terrible case of misalignment that all of the employees that I'd hired pretty much had been hired for that second company, not the first company. And so there, there, was, not a, there, there was a very small likelihood that they were going to be extremely committed to the top company. And so that led to November 2010, right after I got back from hanging out with Seth, that I laid off 25% of my team, and I stopped accepting work from our number one client, and decided that I was, going to, I was going to build a great company going forward. And so I pretty much had to make a big change in my existing company. I had the wrong product, I had the wrong team, I had the wrong clients, I had the wrong pricing. So <laughs> kind of the wrong company. So that led to 2011. I remember January 5th, I announced I announced our new vision, which was going to be landing pages, um, iterative testing, and tech skills. We were going to become, we were going to be data driven. We were going to run the whole testing platform for landing pages. And we were going to stop accepting. We were going to let a lot of our small email clients go, not going to accept any new email clients. And we were going to start ramping down our big ones. We launched, I had a new team. 25% uh, had left, another 25% kind of drifted away on their own, and then I hired 50, 10 new people, another 50% that in the first six months. Uh, brand new team, way more senior, and totally committed to the new vision. We built a new website. We took off Interactive from our name. We started the website completely over. New brand, everything. We landed five new clients. All of them were testing clients, including Adobe, which is, um, also runs the biggest platform, which is a great case of irony, uh, and really helped us lead into this year. And we had completely new pricing. 
And then, uh, so that wrapped up 2011, uh, gave us momentum into 2000, or 2012. And that's when we finally got serious about having strategy. Up until this point, for the up, you know, up until that big moment in 2010, we had been, everything was being opportunistic, where we were just letting the business happen to us. I did, thought I was being strategic and that we were looking into media and search marketing, but it was really all driven by seeing these opportunities that looked like they could be good. Um, we we're still being reactive to opportunities that were kind of coming to us, the type of clients that we already had. We didn't ever really start from a target market and a strategic standpoint. We never actively invested in something to make the market. Uh, and this year was the first time that we did that. And the other thing that we got serious about was our culture. We stopped focusing on our clients first, and we started focusing on the team first, which is a pretty big shift. And so this year was our go-to market year. We announced a total focus in tackling our target market, which was the enterprise testing clientele. We completely fo stayed focused on alignment. Q1, we had like three or four different re retreats where the whole leadership team, we all went off all together and chose our, did our positioning together, our sales strategy together, um, and our pricing strategy so that everyone knew exactly what was going on. It was the first time we had a director of marketing. And so we had a huge, invested in a huge marketing presence at Adobe Summit and the ArtClick Summit. And we invested a lot more than we've ever done in our thought leadership. Um, and lastly, we continue to get our process right. I mean, getting, we basically built a whole new product last year. And so this, once we got a couple case studies, now we make, go from good to great uh, with our process. And this year, we landed AOL again. Only this time, we're not doing pop-ups. We're actually running their testing, entire testing program for them. And they became a medium-sized client in uh, July. And then uh, just this past month, they've quadrupled their spend with us. They, we have an over a million dollar uh, contract next year. And um, they've said that we've heard that they've, they've said that you know, we've reintroduced testing and that adding us to their team was a game changer for, for their group. Uh, and it's been incredibly fulfilling for all of us. We're, more technically, we're doing more technically advanced stuff for them than we've done for any other client up to, to, to date. Culture has also become a top priority. Um, the team is, uh, we're totally core value focused. Uh, we ring a, a hit a gong every time we launch a test. Uh, we have a beer keg in our office and people drink it, you know, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so to wrap up uh, my story, what I've learned about building my company is that client service is still king, uh, but you have to have the right service and the right clients. This is something that we've had as part of our DNA since the beginning, and we got it wrong a little bit in the middle, but um, it's still it's super important, and it was still finding the right balance um, with client service. That culture is a predictor of performance. Uh, that if you focus on your internal culture, then they will focus on the client service. But take care of your people first, so they can take care of you and your company. That, um, it's 1% vision and 99% alignment. At first, I needed to give the company direction and a vision of where we're going, because that was part of the problem, those three bad years. But then the real work happens, at getting the entire team on board and, and, and reinvesting constantly in alignment. It doesn't happen on its own. And the big thing is just, it was kind of a, hu a huge shift, was I was all about the opportunistic, organic kind of growth. Uh, because it was successful for a long time, and it was really how we started with novel projects, you know, to do, to really go after these opportunities and being open to them. Um, but that only that broke at a certain scale, and that is when we had we had no choice but to shift over to be a truly strategic growth. Uh, and I wish that we had been able to do that a lot earlier. So that's my story. Cool. So if you guys remember. You know, we started off with Novel Projects, this website company. We all worked together. Um, we eventually decided to split it. Uh, one of the partners continued to run the website company, Novel Projects, and I split off to run uh, what was called Novel Labs. And so the idea was to take some of the product ideas that I had come up with and start a product company instead of a services company. And then Brooks had split off to do Brooks Bell to focus on the, the creative portion of the business. And so um, when I split off into Novel Labs, I had a 
a few different product ideas I wanted to pursue. I was a software programmer, so at that time I could, I could build my own, my own products. And so um, at the, for 2004, I was kind of try, trying to pursue three or four different products. I had the idea for ShareFile. I had another product called PixelPoint that I had developed. And I was licensing to AOL, actually, and a few other products. And I was trying to really work on all of them at the same time, not really making very much progress. Um, and so in early 2005, I said, OK, I need to focus on one of these products if I'm going to make any kind of headway at all. And so I went through the process of trying to figure out which product it was I was going to focus on. Um, and so I talked to different friends. And there were a couple of VCs that I knew that I talked to. And um, almost nobody advised me to, to go with ShareFile, including Brooks. <laughs> um, and you know, when I talked to VC friends, they would say, yeah, you know, that's kind of an idea out of the year 2000. And there's other players in the space. You don't have any kind of competitive differentiation. But um, and just as a quick background, ShareFile is basically a um, software designed for businesses to allow uh, companies to transfer files that are either too large or too confidential to send by email. That's what it was at the time we launched it. And it's pretty similar even today. And so um, you know, VCs, it wasn't a hot space. VCs kind of were against it. And uh, most, most people didn't understand why I had any kind of a competitive advantage to, to, to do the, the product. But what I noticed is that if I would go to a cocktail party and talk to somebody about the idea for ShareFile and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about building this business ShareFile. It lets companies set up a password protected area where they can give clients a login and exchange files. Almost every company would have a, a use for it. So if I talked to a nonprofit, they would say, yeah, my board, I have a board of directors, and we could actually use this to exchange documents. Or if I talked to an accountant, they said, I need to transfer tax returns, and they have, those have social security numbers, and so I need to find a secure way to do that. It seemed like every business had a, had a use for ShareFile. And even though there were a couple players out there, one was called XDrive, the other was called Streamload, that, that did the same thing and were already big and established. Both of them are out of business now, by the way. But um, I figured I can at least carve out a niche, and maybe I can get a few hundred customers or a 1,000 customers and get some good cash flow going. And so I decided to, um, to launch ShareFile. This is a little snippet of from the original business plan for ShareFile. And actually, um, we still do a lot, of, a lot of the same thing. And there's some, some controversy about whether, as an entrepreneur, it's necessary to write a business plan at all. I did. Um, I would say that creating a business model is really crucially important. So I, at the same time I did this, I also created a simple model in Excel, kind of a waterfall model, where I could plug in some variables around cost per acquisition, of a free trial, free trial conversion rate, um, churn rate, and I could see as I invested more money what would happen to my customer base and my revenues over time. And I actually use, I still have the model, and I still use, use it probably 75% the same as it was back then. And so what I would say is having a business model is critical. A business plan is probably optional. But if you do create a business plan, for me, I would update it for the first few years every year. And it is nice to be able to look back on your, your own business plan to see how you were thinking about the market back then and what you thought the competitors were and what you thought your revenue plans were, um, just to kind of track your own thinking over time. So I decided you know, back in July, I'm going to pursue ShareFile. And I started to go ahead and code it. And so this is a picture of me, kind of one, one developer sitting in a dark room uh, coding the product. And I think I started at the end of August. And it took me about two months. And, um, Dan, who was running Novel Projects, also worked with me during those two months to get it launched. And we launched around early November of 2005. And then about a month later, I started actually doing some advertising and, and marketing of the product. And so <clears throat> um, I decided I'm going to give this two years. I'm going to take two years without salary. I had $4,000 a month of revenue coming in from the Pixel Point product at AOL. And I, got, I bought a quarter rack of servers, which is like about that much server space. Bought a couple servers and um, opened up a Google AdWords account, a pay-per-click pay ad, AdWords account. And I took the budget, the remaining budget, and invested it in Google AdWords. And so we had a 30-day free trial process online. So you know, I spent some money on Google AdWords. It drove free trials. The first month, I think we got 20 free trials, and four of them converted to paid accounts the next month a little bit more. And I decided I'll give it a year. And at the end of 2006, if I got to 100 or 150 customers, 
I would keep going with it and I would, I would kind of validate the business model. Otherwise, I would just move on and work on one of my other product ideas. And so the, um, around May of 2006, five months in, I got to my 100 customer mark. And by the end of the year, I actually got to 550 customers. At that time, I was working probably you know, two hours a day or so on ShareFile. And the rest of the time, I was actually working in the Brooks Bell business because that was, you know, we had a lot more revenue happening in that business at the time. And I hired on a, a half-time employee. So end of year one, one and a half employees and you know, maybe equivalent of one employee, 500 customers. Um, end of year two, we had uh, four employees and we got to 2,000 customers. So the model was really working. We kept scaling up the, the paid search advertising. And with a software as a service business, it's, and when you're bootstrapping like I did, it's hard to build up momentum at the beginning because when customers are paying you, say, $50 a month, get 1,000 customers, that's, that's pretty significant. But if you have 500 customers, it sounds like a lot of money, you know, uh, $10,000 $10, a month or $25,000 a month. But when you hire a few employees and have office space, it disappears really quickly and doesn't give you a lot of money for marketing. But the great thing about the software as a service model is as you start to build momentum, there's a snowball effect that happens. And so, you know, we were four employees at the end of 2007, year two, and then it was 15 employees, and then 5,000 customers, and 30 employees, and 45 employees, and, um, and then 80 employees, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, we happen to be in a great market with, with really great timing. So this is a, a graph of Google Trends for the searches for the term cloud computing. You can see that like this whole cloud thing that you see on commercials and everything now, up until Q4 of 2007, didn't even exist at all. Um, and the iPhone launched in Q4 of 2007. And so you know, I said we launched in, in late 2005. So we, we were ahead of that trend. And um, the interesting thing is by the time the trend became hot and our space became really hot, it was already, it was already really too late. And so. Uh, one of the things that, that I've learned throughout the process of ShareFile and watching other startups is that venture capitalists and kind of the whole mainstream community is usually 12 to 24 months behind whatever the trend is that they, you need to be in front of. And so by the time a trend becomes hot, then it's probably a really bad area to get into for your business. Um, and so what I focused on for ShareFile was not really worrying about what VC said or what other people said, but looking at the bottom-up demand and seeing that when I talked to people, there was an interest in this kind of a product. And that's really what drove me to, to decide on ShareFile as the product rather than doing a top-down analysis and saying, this market is hot. It's growing you know, a huge amount. So you know, we continued to grow. We got to, uh, I think in, in early 2011, we were at 40 or 50 employees. And the market really did start to heat up. And so I had one competitor that raised $30 million, another one that raised $50 million at the time. And we were still bootstrapped. We never raised any money. And I still felt like we could compete in the space. And then in February of 2011, one of my competitors, I got an email and saw that one of my competitors had raised another $48 million. And so they were up to $80 million in funding. And there was a rumor that another one of my competitors was raising $250 million. And there's a saying that I like, which is, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And I started to sense that that might be hap about to happen in my own space, and, um, which actually did happen. The, the other competitor raised $250 million. The competitor that had raised 48 and had been up to $80 million has raised $200 more million since, and they've raised $280 million. And so we realized that we needed to do something. We either needed to raise a lot of venture capital at that point or think about a strategic acquisition. And so in um, October of 2011, we were acquired by Citrix. So we were about 80 employees at the time, and that's a screenshot from TechCrunch. Um, Citrix acquired ShareFile, the Dropbox for enterprises. Um, and so that was an uh, interesting moment. And two weeks after the acquisition closed, I was at Citrix's big conference called Synergy in Barcelona. And this is a picture of me demoing um, the ShareFile product in Barcelona to a live audience of 4,000 people. And so. It was kind of a surreal experience in six years going from the picture of the guy coding by himself in a dark room to the guy showing that product you know, to 4,000 people two weeks after we were acquired by Citrix. Um, since the acquisition continued on, some of you guys might have seen 
We uh, got a job development grant recently from the state of North Carolina um, to add another 337 jobs to the state over the next five years. We have about 200 employees now. And we also committed to um, 130,000 square foot space in downtown Raleigh, re revitalizing the warehouse district in downtown Raleigh. So we've, we've continued on, continued the vision. Um, I'm the general manager now of the data sharing group at Citrix, so I basically still run the, run the share file product. So what's so awesome, I think, is the biggest accomplishment for both of us is just last month, we were both rate, um, named the number one best place to work uh, in the triangle, Jess as from the large company perspective and Brooks Bell as from the small company perspective. And I think that's the first time in history uh, that a married couple has uh, one, been named number one in both, in two categories. And so, you know, um, I'll just go through this pretty quick because I want to talk about a couple of, of learnings um, and, and advice that I have. But some of the things I learned from ShareFile, first of all, just my whole entrepreneurial journey, I guess, is that it really is a marathon. Um, I started way back in first company, way back in 2001, and um, here it is, 2012, 11 years later, and I'm still not totally done with my entre entrepreneurial journey. I'm still part of Citrix after the, after the acquisition. And I really think about entrepreneurship as a career choice or a lifestyle choice. It's not, I don't think you can go into it thinking that you have a hot idea, you go in, you build it, you sell it, and you're out. You know, if you really think about the steps and the number of years, it's, it is a, it's a, each, each venture you do, if it's successful, is probably a, you know, 10 to 15 year commitment to really build it out and get it to, to uh, where you want it to be. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind from a couple of perspectives. One, that it is a big commitment when you, when you get into entrepreneurship, but also that you need to pace yourself. It's a marathon. So, you know, early, in the early days, I was working and sleeping in the office, you know, three, four nights in a row, uh, working late every night. And then about three years ago, I realized that if I, if I, if I want to really sustain this, I need to start getting some balance and, and um, I can't continue to, to burn myself out as an entrepreneur. Um, importance of customer service as well. And um, the other thing I left off here is the importance of core values. So with that, um, I'll spend a few minutes and kind of distill some general advice and, and thoughts that I have about entrepreneurship and how to, how to think about you know, um, your process of coming up with an idea and building a business. And so one of the things I like to, uh, I like to show is this is a picture of this guy named Roy Sullivan. And the, the reason I like to show it is that he's a, he's a park ranger from, from Virginia but um, he holds the Guinness World Record for most number of times struck by lightning in a lifetime. And so I, I was reading about him, and he was actually in the curious case of Benjamin Button. They talked about him. I don't know if they gave his name or not. But uh, I was reading about him, and, and I was reading about the last time he got struck by lightning and uh, printed it out. I think it's pretty interesting to share. So, so it says, um, on Saturday morning, June 25th, 1977, Sullivan was fishing in a freshwater pool when he was struck the seventh time. The lightning hit the top of his head, singeing his hair, and traveled down, burning his chest and stomach. Sullivan turned to his car, and then another unexpected thing happened. A bear appeared and tried to steal trout from his fishing line. Sullivan had the strength and courage to strike the bear with a tree branch. He claimed that was the 22nd time he had hit a bear with a stick in his lifetime. And so the reason, I, the reason I, I like to think back on this is that the world is, is a big place, and there are unlikely things that happen all the time. And you know, when I look at something like a Twitter or a Facebook, I really think about Roy Sullivan. And it's just another case of uh, someone winning the lottery or someone getting struck s seven times by lightning. And that's not the, the example to necessarily look at as the, the best way to build your own business as an entrepreneur. And so um, oftentimes people look at something like, like a Facebook and think, I need to build this world-changing, multi-billion dollar business in, a, in order to be successful. And I think in reality, um, starting with an idea that's much more narrow and then expanding it and generalizing it later is a way better approach than starting with a really grand, big idea and trying to boil the ocean. Um, because most likely you won't make any progress trying to do that. 
And the interesting thing is I read on TechCrunch a little while ago, there was a video that surfaced from 2005 that even showed, for examples like Facebook, um, they had a, a video from Mark Zuckerberg in 2005, and his only vision for Facebook was to be an online directory for colleges. And so he generalized his vision over time as well. So oftentimes you can look at the end result of a big empire that somebody's built and think that that's what they were actually trying to do when they started, and it's, it's, it's really rarely the case. And I would never advise you know, an entrepreneur to, to start with such a, a, a broad vision. And so kind of the, what I like to think about instead is Mark Zuckerberg, kind of Facebook, that's the equivalent of um, trying to become a, a rock star. So you see a rock star out there, and they're, you know, they're super successful. But instead of, when you think about it, though, most musicians actually make minimum wage. So if you try to become a rock star, most likely you're just going to end up you know, working as a waiter somewhere and, and uh, make minimum wage. And so instead, I, I really like to think about um, something like, an uh, example like Papa John's Pizza, basically building an idea that can succeed on a small scale before it succeeds on a large scale. So this guy, John Schnatter, is the founder of Papa John's Pizza. And he started with $1,300, um, and he uh, built a pizza oven in his dad's bar. And uh, he's built a business that's now $1.3 billion business. And so it could succeed on a small scale. He could have just opened one pizza shop, and that would have been OK. Or it could have been five. I think now they have thousands of them. But it was a scalable model. It wasn't an all or nothing kind of proposition like, like services like Facebook or Twitter are. And so it's great to have services like that. But um, as an entrepreneur, it's not the best approach if you want to be successful. And so kind of a, a corollary to that is that I think, in my opinion, funding is probably a bad idea for your first company, partially because um, most likely, you're never going to get funding anyway. And so if your idea depends on funding, then it's a non-starter. You're probably not going to be successful. <clears throat> but also because it kind of violates the, the idea that you can build a business that can succeed on a small scale before it succeeds on a large scale. If you take on venture funding, typically the way venture capital funds are structured, they need to make pretty sizable investments. And in order to see a return on their investment, they need a pretty big multiple. And so you're either going to have to be extremely successful or, or not successful at all. And so that's why I think that, if, it, if at all possible, try to come up with creative ways to, um, to start your company without funding and get it off the ground. And for us, starting with a service business is what allowed us to um, end up funding the product business that, that I ended up building later and, and giving me a lot of the experience that I needed. So with that. Um, We'll wrap up. I think that's, that's all we had to cover, and we can open it up for Q&A. Yeah, let's do Q&A for okay. about uh, 10 minutes. OK, sure. It was mainly, it was very difficult, but what I did is when I, when I was looking at data, I went to conferences with analysts. I just went to a ton of analytics conferences for three years. And so that was essentially get, just getting out to the market and meeting analysts and just asking lots of questions and starting to build that network is uh, essentially how I did it. I still don't have an extremely great grasp of statistics. I mean, I've lost all my Excel skills years ago. But it was mostly finding the right people and having a broad idea of how it could work. Any questions? I'm going to grab the microphone so that the uh, audio can pick it up. I think he's got a thing that can come as well. So, other questions? Ten minutes. Go ahead, Eddie. So, Jesse, Aaron, how do you? Uh, how has difference gone from Shurfile to Citrix? How's that transition been? Um, Do you mind just repeating the question? Sure. So the question was, how has the transition been from going, moving from Shurfile into Citrix? And it's, it's actually gone very, very well. Um, I wasn't sure how it would go, because I'd only had a boss in my entire life you know, for 11 months before Citrix acquired us. And I'd never worked for a public company, never worked for a large company. And so, um, but Citrix has treated us really well. And, we got very lucky. We had a, 
a real match of core values with Citrix when they made the acquisition. And they also, we were strategically important to Citrix. And so Citrix is an 8,000 person company. We're pretty small, but they decided to incubate us. So we are our own division. I report directly to the CEO of the company. And um, we've gotten a lot more attention than many ac acquisitions do. We're still in incubation mode. So I still own the full P&L, and it feels a lot like running the business before the acquisition. So I'm happy to report I'm one of the, I think I'm one of the exceptions that proves the rule. How much of that did you know prior? The core values thing we did know, definitely. And so, you know, Talk we, about core values for a second. So um, you know, back in, in 2009, which was like almost three years into ShareFile, we finally decided to get around to defining core values. And um, I was hesitant to do it for a long time because I thought, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and eventually this is a product idea and eventually, you know, I'm probably going to sell and move on to the, the next company. And we're not like trying to cure cancer or anything. We're just helping people share big files. And so <laughs> should we really have a big, you know, ambitious mission? Um, but we went ahead and, and went through the process and it worked. For, most companies will do that and they'll just kind of file away their core values and and, and no one really knows what they are, but the process really worked for us. And so we came up with three core values, customer-centric, data-driven, and responsible growth. And we came up with our mission, which was to raise the bar for service in the field of technology. And um, I think that was one of the big drivers that's led to the great culture that we have and, and success that we've had. And it was very important to us when we joined on with Citrix that there was a match. And it was really clear during the process of meeting uh, Mark, the CEO of Citrix, and the other team members that um, really within five minutes, I think both of us knew that they were looking at other companies and we were, we were being approached by other companies and we both knew that it was just the right fit. And I think that's the biggest driver for the success of, of acquisitions in M&A. Um, what has been su surprising since you've joined of a change that you didn't anticipate? Um, I don't think there's necessarily any changes I didn't anticipate, but it's... Being in a big company, there are just some things you have to do, like you know, guests have to get their own individual Wi-Fi passwords, and we have security cameras and badges, and you know, we have to use SAP, and which is like I need a full, I have a full-time assistant, and her job is just like doing my expense reports in SAP because it's so so hard. Whereas before, people would just come to me and say, hey, you know, I want to buy this thing that costs like fifty thousand dollars. Can I do it? And I'd be like, Yeah, sure. That's fine. That's reasonable. <laughs> now it's not nearly as seamless as that. So um, you know, it's 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 part of the it's a tough a tough part of being part of a large company. But the way I, I explain to employees and the way I think about it myself is that we also get a lot of credibility for being part of Citrix and. We can talk to large enterprises and sell thousands of seat license deals because there's a certain amount of trust that comes from being part of a, a large public company because they expect you to do all the stuff that you do that's a huge pain around security and compliance and everything like that. And so it's the trade-off that you make. And I think overall for the business, um, we, have, we have a lot more opportunities opened up to us having the credibility of Citrix and the sales force of Citrix and the price that we have to pay is that you know, we have to actually follow through on all the PCI and security compliance stuff that, that uh, you know, maybe as a startup you don't have to pay as much attention to. A um, question that I had was, how do you gauge or what kind of steps do you say you feel is a big step from idea to actually putting a foot on the ground and doing what you did with ShareFile? So how do you gauge between what's just a really good idea and what's worth your time and taking action? Um, I mean, for me, right away, like when I'm thinking about an idea, I dismiss any idea that doesn't, that I, I don't immediately have a um, revenue model for and a go-to market strategy for. And by go-to market strategy, I mean like, even if you have a great idea and there's a great revenue model, the, the key component where I see most entrepreneurs fall down is the go-to market strategy. So like, how do I acquire a new customer for this idea? at a payback period that is less than you know, the lifetime value of that customer. And if, even if there's a great idea, if it's too expensive to actually reach the customers and, and acquire them to use this, this product, then I shy away from that. I know there are many stories of successful entrepreneurs and successful ideas that didn't follow that model, like Twitter. But like I said, 
Um, I don't think there's any foolproof formula for being an entrepreneur, but I think those are the outliers, and if you follow the you know, that, that as a basic principle, it'll probably lead you in, in the right direction more often than not. And so that's kind of um, really what I focus on. So I've heard some uh, impressions in some circles that, you know, as an organically growing small business or startup, you have to be totally unique. You have to, like, stand out. You know, no one else should be really doing what you're doing. You know, obviously that's not true, right? Mm -hmm. You guys have proven that. Uh, how did you competitively differentiate yourself or what, how did you arrive at your competitive positioning in the market um, to enable you to be successful? Yeah, well, I'll start. Maybe you can add, add some color. I mean, yeah, I, I, I totally disagree with that. And I think, I think that's an impression that a lot of entrepreneurs have. And as far as I'm concerned, most entrepreneurs make things way harder on themselves than they need to be. They try to, it's hard enough to just run a business and execute successfully and deal with management and leadership challenges of, of just being successful as a business. But then if you add another layer on top of it and say, now I need to come up with something that's totally unique and no one has done it before, um, it makes it so much harder. And so really, we deliberately, in our first business, launched a business that we knew was a commodity website development. And it was kind of like being a lawyer or a doctor you know, or an accountant. It's like, if you do a good job, then you'll probably be successful. And if you don't, you won't. But one thing that we didn't have to worry about was you know, the business model for creating websites. And to add to that, if you're entrepreneurial minded, then you're going to run it differently than your other average non-entrepreneurial minded person. A lot of people, you know, they'll get into website design or you know, agency work just, just kind of because they're a good designer themselves. And they have no real vision for it taking over. Having, they don't have an exit plan. They approach it from a totally different way. So most small ideas are run by someone like that. And so if you take an, ex an example, a, a proven business model and you are, it's led by a really smart entrepreneurial minded person, then they can take that idea and scale it and make it into a great idea um, and just take that one element off the table. And both of our businesses came from, they both kind of de got, were derived from a website business, which is kind of a commodity business. But was, in being in that business, we identified the online advertising opportunities and analytics, and then I identified the need for ShareFile because we had customers coming in and asking for you know, that type of a solution, and I saw the pattern there. And so eventually, we, we kind of got into the mix and got into the game. And then we, once we had some revenue and had some customers, then we were able to identify you know, more opportunities and differentiate ourselves more. We've got two last questions here, and then we'll let you kind of say closing thought. So uh, you both spoke about various aha moments, Jesse, when you sort of realized that Citrix would be the right fit for you, and, and, and Brooks, when you realized you had to pivot and, and you, there were staff layoffs and, and, and more hires after that. When you're building a team, out, outside of talent questions, which are obvious, what criteria do you look for in terms of, to, to, to create a culture? Core values is the number one thing. You hire for core values, you fire for core values. I think you just start with core values, um, then you will attract the people that are you attract then based on basically personality, the right personality, um, and then you, uh, and then their, you know, their execution, their, their t other talent is more table stakes or also something you can train. Um, but I think if you just focus on core values and, and really make sure they match them, uh, then you'll be way ahead of the game. The you know, other thing I'll add to that is like, when you think about the concept of team, team is, is critically important. Up until recently, I really kind of, I don't think I was thinking about that idea in the right way. The, what I immediately thought of when somebody said hire the, a great team was hire all the best people I possibly can. But in reality, if you think about like a sports team, um, you know, like in, in the Olympics, we have the dream team, the USA team, and um, they did win the gold medal, but they didn't beat Spain by that much. And it, looking at the two teams, it's like, why didn't they beat those guys by like 40 points? And um, you, you, you see cases within sports all the time where a collection of individual superstars um, isn't necessarily as good or, or that much better than a collection of um, kind of players that are okay, that are gelling really well as a team. And so I think that's really important. And you know, with, our, with our own executive team, 
we had a good chemistry as a team, and I think that's, that's really critical to think about more than let me just find all the best people I possibly can. I think getting your team right is more important than your strategy. I think it's probably the most important decision. And I think that my company would have, we would have got, we wouldn't have had all those, those, um, those years if we had the right team a lot earlier. Uh, I think that getting the team right can save you thousands and thousands of dollars and years uh, of time. And so if there's a skill that you want to learn sooner rather than later, it's how, how to build a, a great team. Hi, I'm um, James from Fuqua MMS program. Uh, my question is for Brooks. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, your company enjoyed the organic growth and then later on switched to strat uh, strategic growth. So when did you, did you know that you have to make the switch? You know, what makes you think, well, organic growth is not the best way to go about it anymore? Um, I don't know when, like, that moment of, like, opportunistic versus strategic struck me. I think it was more that I realized that we, I had no control over my future, that I didn't have my forecast for my, com my clients was very short. It was only like a month out, and that's not a good way to run the business. And when people would ask me what my strategic plan was, I really couldn't answer that. Um, and I just didn't know, I didn't have a business model. It was just all these like unknowns. And I, I think that once I, those started to add up, uh, com and then our stress started adding up, and then just it felt like something was wrong. And then when I finally realized like the depth of what was wrong, I think that was mostly, I realized that we needed to, um, I guess we kind of realized that one, what the, once we, we, we then identify the target market, that was the first thing, is I thought the market is these test and target clients who have underutilized account. I know they're out there, I've met them, I know there's a problem, there's an opportunity there. And we are going to go after that opportunity. And that, by having that, that strategic direction, that one thing, this one target market, then we built the whole rest of the strategy around that. So much, is there a final thought that you both would like to share? Um, you know, I, I guess just my final thought is I'm really, we're both Duke graduates, and so I'm really excited about the momentum that we're seeing within Duke and great job that Howie and his team have been doing and the, and the very cool things that are happening in Incube. And so um, entrepreneurship, I think, has come a long way, and I've seen it over the last 10 or 12 years, and the quality of the ideas is, is better, the energy is better at Duke, and so I'm really excited about what all you guys are going to be doing, and you guys are going to be standing up here in a few years as well, I'm sure. To add to that, the Triangle is becoming a, a crazy awesome place to be doing this. That this is the next, the next five years here are going to be transformative. And so getting started, this is a great time to be starting your company in the Triangle. It doesn't seem like quite as dynamic as New York or Austin or, those, or the Bay Area quite yet, but it's, it's just like what Jess is saying, you're staying ahead of that trend we can tell, kind of be in it, and having seen how far it's come, that we are like a year or two ahead of the trend, that people haven't quite identified it, but it is, we've already seen some cre like amazing momentum. And I think starting your company here um, will put you way ahead of the, of the trend, whereas in a couple of years, it's gonna blow up, and, um, and it'd be advantageous to you to be, a, be here already fully established. Thank you so much. Let's give them a big round of applause. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.